All right, well, we are showing the time at 10.03, so in the essence of time, we will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. I hope 2021 has been better to you guys than 2020 was. Um, as most of you know, I'm Christine Moore. I'm the first vice president of North Carolina APCO, and on behalf of North Carolina mm -hmm. APCO, uh, Chapter President Grayson Gustav and North Carolina NIDA President Randy Beeman, we do welcome you to the January 13th, 2021 chapter meeting of North Carolina APCO and North Carolina NINA. Before we begin our meetings, we want to recognize our corporate sponsors, AT&T, Carolina Recording Systems, Horizon Consoles by SBFI, Solutions, and we'd like to thank them for their continued support of our chapters. We're happy to have nearly 75 attendees registered. We show 54 that are actually logged on at this time to attend today's meeting on Zoom and countless others that'll be joining us on YouTube and Facebook Live. As we begin the meetings, all attendees have been muted. Additionally, we ask for all who are attending except for the board members to please turn off your cameras to help us to conserve bandwidth. There will be opportunities for questions and comments at the end of each meeting. I will be monitoring the group chat. We would also invite you to submit any questions or comments using that chat feature in the Zoom meeting during this time. Before we begin, we would like to honor the United States of America with the national anthem. So this morning, we will first welcome one of our corporate sponsors, Horizon Consoles by FB, SBFI, to take a few moments to share some information about their company. Then this will be followed by the North Carolina APCO portion of the chapter meeting and then the North Carolina NINA chapter meeting. It is now my privilege and honor to introduce Jennifer Taylor with Horizon Consoles by SBFI to share some information about their company. Jennifer? Jennifer, you are muted. There you go. Hi, I just wanted to turn on my camera just for a brief minute. I'll turn it off here in a minute to, to go into the presentation, but I just wanted to say hello in person and put uh, my face with my name. I appreciate the time that you guys are giving me this morning. I have about 10 minutes. I will not go over that 10 minutes in respect to everyone's time, but I'm really excited to share this information. So thank you. Let's see. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, so like I said, I just wanted to give you a quick a quick overview this morning. Um, I try to think about what I wanted to review in this 10 minutes, and I really just want to tell you who, who we are, how we work, and just show you some pictures of our furniture. And for those of you that need more information, then I will have my contact information up at the end, and you are welcome to contact me directly. So the major question I get from the public safety sector is, who is SBFI? And are you Horizon Consoles or are you SBFI? So I wanted to take a minute here just to clear that up. 
So if you see on your screen, SBFI Group is our parent company. And we were established in the 70s. We've been around for a really long time. But within SBFI, we have different divisions. So you see on the screen, um, we have SBFI Financial and that division does trading desk for um, the largest banks all over the world, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley. Then you see on the right, we have something called ARC Workspace. That is our monitor arm systems um, in which we create different ones based on the environment, but they're pretty well received, so they have their own separate division. So then in the middle is where you'll see Horizon Consoles, and that's probably what you're most familiar with. That is our mission critical division. So we make furniture for many different industries within the mission critical um, and public safety being one of them. So that is why you sometimes hear SBFI and Horizon Console. We, we are both, but I really just wanted to take a minute to clear that up this morning. Um, we are a global company. We have facilities in Asia, UK, and the United States, um, all manufacturing facilities. But lucky for you, all of our furniture for the United States is made just out of Asheville, North Carolina. So considering this, you can understand um, we are super vested in supporting North Carolina where we can, and we are very proud and honored to be a sponsor of the Nina um, APCO North Carolina chapters. Thank you. Um, I only want to touch base on a couple things on the slide you see in front of you. I wanted to say, you know, what makes us unique other than just being from North Carolina? The owner of Horizon also owns his own paint and powder coat facility, wood facility, fabrication facility, heat treating facility, and all of those companies are also in North Carolina. So we have this vertical integration going on. But what, what does that even mean for you? Um, what that means is we can design anything you want. We can tweak things to your room space, your needs, and we can do it very cost efficiently because we own that supply chain and we have all of those resources in North Carolina. So each project we take, you know, we have a project team, a design consultant, and engineer or project management installation but you only have that one point of contact so SBFI does take on floor plan analysis analyzing your equipment sightline analysis storage analysis whatever we can do to help personalize your space and we can do it again very easily because we own that supply chain and I could keep on about the process but it's super exciting for me but sometimes can be boring for others so I'm just going to jump right into showing you some images of some 911 centers, North Carolina to be exact. Now what you'll notice is some of the photos that I have will have the county's name. That is because I got permission from that group to share information. If it's undisclosed, it's typically a high security area and I can't share the information of the location. So one of my favorite rooms is Wayne County, which you see on the screen. We recently um, did this install, and I just want to point out a couple things of how we came up with this particular design. It was really important to Wayne to have all of their monitors on that one row, and they had six. So I needed to come up with a console design um, shape um, in the space and also ergonomics. So I worked to come up with this um, larger console for them. They also wanted the, um, the glass, as you can see, the um, etched glass with their logo, with the different colors. They are actually using that for an internal indicator system as well. So um, it was really important to be able to give them access to changing those colors at different times and at different locations. The other thing that's really important is having collaboration um, areas within their um, end users. So you can see we did tables and binder storage or personal storage at each of the consoles. We also, let me go back there. We also did a lot of, um, it goes back to that customization, a lot of customization for the equipment within their console. So I really took every single piece of equipment they had and designed spaces within the console. So you see on the right, the rack units, um, and I made access throughout the entire console to get to that information. The next 911 room in North Carolina was Lincoln County, and I love this room as well. That's why I chose it. They had a very different um, approach in regards to the way they work. They really wanted their users spaced out. They wanted those supervisors up on that raised floor. They wanted their monitors in this what I call football goal 
post. And something that was super important to them were acoustics. So we added a lot of acoustical aspects to the console as well as I worked with the architect and we came up with acoustical panels along the walls and the ceilings to make sure they felt really comfortable with that hot button that was important to them. Okay, next, I pulled this one to really just show you our customization piece that I talked about before. Um, this is a call center and if you see that long table in the middle, um, the customer came and they really wanted this collaboration um, table, but they needed it to just be a table and the other side, they needed it to be a touchscreen digital platform. So if you press a button, that work surface raises up, flips over and it becomes a regular table. But then in times of distress or collaboration, they can press the button, the, the work surface flips over, comes down and they can touch string and all work together in that room. So I thought that was really important to show in a, a neat project that we worked with. Next is, this is also a dispatch center, but for utilities. And one thing, and the reason I chose this to show you is something unique about this is this customer needed 20 monitors at the console. So I needed to come up with how we can best make 20 monitors ergonomic. And also they wanted to be able to take two consoles push them together and create one huge console on the fly. So we have a conversion kit at the bottom of each console and these consoles can be pushed together, wired up and created as one, whether it be a training or a natural disaster or what it may be. I thought that was really neat. Um, the other project I chose is, this is a training room to conversion room. So um, you can press the button, the monitors come up out of the work surface, you work when you need be, press the button, it goes back down. Um, it gives them the ability to use this space in multiple ways and keep um, their information and, and cable management tidy in there. In the essence of time, because I'm watching it, I promise, I want to just continue to show you some images and then at the end there will be my contact information if anybody has any questions we can do that as well. So here is another 911 room that I just love so I wanted to show I love the ambient lighting and the video board. Here is another one that um, really used this big kidney shaped work surface and again raised their supervisors up on that platform. Here's another one that did it. We did some custom storage in between each one. This is a single plane. This customer didn't need that dual plane aspect. And here is another emergency service room that we just did. So we did different furniture in the space based on what was needed, lockers over on the right. Here's your more traditional, what you see a lot in the 911 um, rooms. And that's it. And, and I did it in eight minutes. <laughs> so out of respect to everyone's time, I just wanted to make my contact information really, really large so you could take it down. You can contact me. I'd be happy to come out and talk to you in person. But again, Nina Abko, thank you for allowing me the time to really um, talk about us and what all we can do. I super appreciate it. Yes, and thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate all of your support over this past year. All right, so good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I will now call the January 13th, 2021 chapter meeting of North Carolina APCO to order. Uh, we welcome everyone joining us this morning, both on Zoom, the Zoom call, um, through our streaming live on um, YouTube, and then those who will be watching the recording later. And now before we begin our meeting, I will ask First Vice President Christine Moore to conduct a roll call. Thank you, Mr. President. Gerald Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. Judy Caparelli. Good morning. Good morning. Byron Burns. Good morning. Good morning. Chad Deese. Good morning. Good morning, Chad. David Dodd. I'm here. Good morning. Greg Dotson. 
Greg Dotson. Samantha Dutch. Good morning. Good morning. Travis Essek. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Missy Ezel. Good morning. Good morning, Missy. Ray Gilliland. Good morning, Ray's here. Good morning. Janet King. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Lori Laughlin. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Lori. Andrew McKenzie. Andrew McKenzie. Melanie Neal. Good morning. Good morning. Randy Surratt. Good morning. Good morning. Tracy Trogdon. Good morning. Good morning, Tracy. Herman Weiss. Good, mo good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Herman. And Elton Wright. Good morning, Christine, I'm here. Good morning. And it looks like the only two we have missing is Greg Dotson and Andrew McKenzie, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Christine. So as we begin our meeting, we have a few special recognitions. Um, this is a time where when we were meeting in person, we would normally ask the individuals to stand up. And while that's not possible in this virtual environment, we still do recognize these individuals for their dedication and commitment to APCO and to the public safety communications industry. So I wanna recognize all past North Carolina APCO presidents, all North Carolina APCO chapter life members, all registered public safety leaders, RPLs, and then all of our certified public safety executives, CPEs that are in attendance today. We appreciate you joining us. So the minutes of our November 18th, 2020 chapter meeting have been posted on the North Carolina APCO website. Uh, is there any discussion about the minutes as posted? All right, so hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as written. Motion. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, so we have a motion from Christine, I believe, and a second. I'll second. From Tracy. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the minutes as written, say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? All right. And like I said, these minutes are posted on our website for anyone to access and, and go back and look at it anytime. Um, we will now move into our chapter reports. The first, I'm happy to announce that Tracy Trogan will be serving as our awards committee chair and our awards will be given out during our virtual conference, which we'll hear more about later in today's meeting. So with that, I will turn it over to Tracy for a few words. Good morning, everyone. Um, the same as we as we usually do, the same awards that we usually do, we plan to do with our virtual conference. Uh, some of those, of course, are Telecommunicator of the Year, Communications Trainer of the Year, Director of the Year, Commercial Member of the Year, President's Appreciation Award, the Line Supervisor of the Year, Radio Technician, uh, Communications Team, and the President's Award. Uh, not, not the President's Award, because that one's not a nominated one. But um, of these awards, uh, take a look around your center, think about your personnel, who you could nominate and uh, send up. We're going to put that out on the list serve soon. And we're going to be taking nominations through March 20th so that we have time to process that in time for our conference. So we just want to kind of put that out there today and uh, let everyone be thinking about it. Perfect. Thank you, Tracy. All right, as we move on in our uh, reports, the next is the commercial advisory report, and that is Elton Wright with Carolina Recording Systems. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, good to be here, I'll be at virtually. Uh, on behalf of the Commercial Council, just want to uh, reiterate our appreciation for all that each of you do uh, every day. Um, the work is meaningful and we really appreciate the opportunity to support you through our commitment to uh, APCO and NINA. Uh, we do meet uh, regularly to talk about ways that we can provide support. It's been a little bit of a challenge with, the, with COVID and uh, the way conferences have played out. So we spend a good portion of our time when we meet together 
just discussing creative ways that we can continue to provide that support uh, in various ways, uh, even though we can't be in person. So that's that's uh, really been the bulk of the things that we have talked about. Something else that uh, we're going to start doing, and this morning will be the first time that this has been done, much like you have the regional ambassadors that provide updates on um, for the regions, uh, we will be providing updates uh, from the various commercial members of both NENA and APCO. So Kristen Donovan with Motorola and myself uh, will be alternating, uh, providing updates from the commercial members uh, on a periodic basis. So this morning, again, this is the first time that we, we were doing it. Uh, we hope to continue to get more and more feedback, but uh, we've got two updates. The first being from SBFI Group. Everybody heard from Jennifer this morning. Uh, everybody got the, had the opportunity to look at some of their um, great products, furniture and consoles. That takes a lot of planning and design work. Uh, they do uh, meet as a global team. Typically, that's in person to come up with new designs and ideas uh, for the products that they provide. Um, that obviously won't be in person this year, and they are working on how to do complex design and um, idea collaboration remotely. Um, and from a CRS perspective, uh, we continue to support ESINET migrations across the state of North Carolina. Um, so just a, 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 an update there, if you have not already migrated to EziNet uh, and you are a CRS customer, please know that there is going to be some level of impact on your recording platform. Uh, there's been situations in the past, particularly when EziNet first started being rolled out, where we would get calls the week of and we would need to scramble. Um, so if, if you are in the midst of planning and preparing for EziNet, uh, and you're one of our customers, please make sure we're involved in the planning process. At a minimum, we do need to be on site to support that migration. Every EziNet migration is different. Um, there can be a lot of complexities associated with the EziNet migration, and so we, 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 we do show up on site for every single migration, um, but there could be licensing impacts or, or additional hardware upgrades that are needed in order to support EziNet. So we just want to make sure that you don't get in a situation where you go to migrate to EziNet and then find out that uh, something is not there in terms of licensing or hardware that's needed. So uh, also, just a final note, uh, we do continue to grow our technical staff. Um, we've added roughly five or six people to the team in 2020. And we have plans to add at least one, if not two, new technical resources uh, in Q1. So that's all I have, Grayson. All right, thank you, Elton. And I would also add for any other commercial partners that do have anything to report, please reach out to Elton or um, Kristen, and they will be happy to report that at any of the upcoming meetings. All right, our next report comes to us from Janet King, the Compassionate Care Committee. Good morning, Mr. President and everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, so we can. Since the last meeting, we sent out approximately 15 cards and I sent one to Melanie Neal. She's recovering from a recent fall. George and Christine Moore, George's father passed away. Carolina Recording Systems, passing of our good friend Steve Lomax, to Steve Lomax's children, William and Anna, Amy Schultz, giving her support through the health journey she's facing, Lori Laughlin, she's recovering from recent hip replacement surgery, Janet Helseth, she's with Franklin County 911, her 36-year-old son <laughs> suffered a stroke and passed away. Send a card to Randolph County, excuse me, Rockingham County Sheriff's Office, passing of employee Ellen Hundley. Pam Collins, retired after 30 years service of Pasquatank in Camden Counties. Send a card of, uh, to Connie Garten. She's uh, recovering from a recent surgery, healing from her medical procedures. To Bobby and Jackie, all good. Jackie is Davie County 91 supervisor and Bobby has some, they both have some health issues that they're recovering from. So we sent them a card of support. George Gacy, Rockingham County, he's suffering from COVID. 
battling that. Kenneth Everett, he's the Caswell County Director. His mother passed away. And Tracy Eldridge, she's a friend to many of us. She's still healing from her ankle injury. Also, her father has passed away. And since I mailed the card, the last three, they should get those today. Um, I understand, I believe she's got another family member that has passed away. And that's the report from my committee, sir. All right, thank you, Janet. Our next report will come from the conference committee and I will call on Missy Ezell, the North Carolina APCO representative to the conference committee and Jason Compton, the North Carolina NENA representative to share an update on our upcoming conference. Good morning. Jason, did you want to give the report or do you want me to or? Oh, I'm sorry, Missy. I figured you were going to go and I, I just jump in, but either way. I can. I just wanted to make sure. Um, the conference committee has partnered with Ricardo Martinez with Within the Trenches Media to host virtualization of the North Carolina Public Safety Communications Conference on a crowdcast platform. This partnership will allow attendees from not only North Carolina, but all over the country and the, um, and the world to join in will be able to participate and watch it. And as well as it'll be recorded, we can come back and watch it at our own uh, time for those of us that, that aren't able to watch it live time. Um, there has been a call for papers. It's been open since December. And it's gonna be open through February 7th. So if you're interested, or if you know someone that's interested, please submit papers um, for the, or uh, through the app, code Nina Listserv, and it's for, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, submit these for our training opportunities and our training uh, coordinators to review and someone could get back to you. The conference is free to all attendees. The sponsorships are still available or sponsorship opportunities are still available. And don't forget to mark your calendars, March 3rd through the 5th in 2021. And the only thing I'll add to that, um, thank you, Missy, is that um, I have placed the, there's a survey monkey um, that we're using. It's been sent out on the list serve. You can also uh, find it if you're joining us um, you know, via Facebook stream or, or, or viewing this after the Zoom call uh, so that you can't see this link, please go out to our social media sites or check your email on the listserv. But for those of you that are on the call, uh, the link is right in the chat for everyone. So uh, if you know a speaker or if you've heard a good speaker somewhere else and would like to see them come to our conference, uh, please forward this along to them and encourage them um, I hope that we'll be able to grab some speakers um, that we may not have heard from in a while or haven't heard from before um, since the virtual format will allow some more flexibility with folks that don't have to travel and such like that. So um, everyone, thank you for your support of our chapters and, and of the conference, and we'll see you in May. And if I may jump in, Missy, I believe you said the dates were in March. Can we confirm the dates just to make sure everyone has them correct? I'm sorry. I may have I may have said March. I have too much on my brain right now. It's May 3rd through the 5th. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So as we move on in our reports, the next will come from the CGIS committee. Um, Steve Lingerfelt. I spoke with him earlier in the week, and he's not able to join us today, but he did tell me that their committee has not met due to the COVID and travel restrictions. So at this time, he has nothing to report from that committee. Um, moving on, we'll now go to David Dodd for the executive council report. I believe he has just a few things to share with us. Good morning, Grayson. Yes, I'll, I'll make it short and sweet. Um, the next executive committee and board of directors meeting will be uh, held virtually on January the 21st. This past Monday, the East Coast region had our pre-meeting call. Uh, the agenda that Frank and Charlene shared looks um, pretty, pretty standard. I didn't see anything uh, really uh, 
a, a noteworthy uh, interest to report there. Um, as far as committees go, um, I'm the chair of the management committee this year, and we're focusing on the agenda for the annual meeting in San Antonio. Uh, one of the things that uh, we will, it will be an agenda item and uh, we will have discussion on is compassionate care. Uh, that's been, uh, it came up in Baltimore in 2019 this past year with the virtual uh, conference in Orlando, we didn't get much done there. We're trying to find a place to put that initiative uh, in within the national structure. Uh, the management committee has spent the last three or four months um, looking at options. We submitted a letter of our findings and recommendations to the uh, APCO International President, uh, just before Christmas, I got a response from her just after Christmas. So we will be um, putting a recommendation or about three recommendations on the floor in San Antonio and uh, the, the full executive council will vote on uh, what they want to see done with, uh, with that program and how it's handled. Um, the only other thing I can think of, uh, just a couple of notes from Monday's call with the, uh, uh, from Joanne Monroe, my counterpart in Virginia, who's on the council, the CEC. Uh, things are moving forward for a, uh, the, the hope is for a live conference in San Antonio in August. Uh, currently, they have sold 466 10 by 10 booths. They have recorded 182 total exhibit exhibitors to date. 12 of those are new exhibitors, first time exhibitors. The uh, and while I haven't heard anything on this, just if you if you are planning on going to San Antonio. Uh, housing for the conference normally opens on April 1st. Uh, I will certainly keep you apprised of anything, any news on that front, but uh, I would keep that date in mind if when it comes to uh, securing your hotel accommodations for, for the conference. And Grayson, you might've been gonna cover this somewhere else, but uh, in the communique we get every month from headquarters as of December the 1st, uh, APCO International showing a total membership of 35,816 members. So I think that's all I've got. Okay, thank you, David. All right, moving on in our reports, next is the historian report and I recognize Randy Thurat. Uh Good morning, Mr. President. Um, just to add that our latest um, national senior member is Gary Michael. Um, Gary was our chapter president from 1999 to 2000. And he was also the uh, security committee chair for the East Coast regional uh, conferences that were held in Greensboro in 2005 and 2008. So he's our latest. I'm still working on the other members. And um, hopefully by our next meeting, I'll, I'll be adding someone else's name to the list. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Randy. All right, our next report is the interagency communications report. And Lewis Cheatham, were you able to join us today? Yes, sir, I am here. Okay, if you want to go ahead. All right, um, just about three things to report. Um, from our SIEC committee, we uh, have been working on encryption over the last year. And just a reminder, if you're an uh, agency that uses encryption, uh, AES encryption is the standard that you need to consider when you buy new radios. So AES encryption, that's the federal standard. And it's also the recommendation from the state. We did work on a, a white paper 
helper to assist agencies with um, coordinating encryption across the state. So um, if you need assistance with that, please reach out to me. Um, a reminder for Viper, the Viper system, uh, of course, TDA, TDMA phase two for P25 uh, is a requirement that's coming up uh, for uh, in order for radios to operate on the Viper system. So just another reminder when you're purchasing radios to make sure that you're getting um, that option. And last thing, just, just to um, mention, uh, when you're purchasing radios, make sure you're purchasing from a, a reputable vendors because we, we are tracking some issues right now in the state with multiple systems in the state where radios have been purchased and they have been uh, programmed with um, information, radio systems, talk groups that were not approved to be programmed. So there's an investigation going on now with some issues that have been occurring. And just a reminder that, you know, make sure you're buying radios from uh, reputable vendors um, so you don't have any issues. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lewis. So the next report is our membership report and I will share that with everyone. Um, as of January 12th, 2021, North Carolina has, APCO has the following membership numbers. Um, associate members is 59, commercial members, we have six, full members, 497, um, online members is 757, bringing our total membership as of yesterday to 1,319 individuals. During our November chapter meeting, um, it was reported our total membership then was 1,578. And again, today our membership is down to 1,319. This does represent a 16% drop in total membership. But as a reminder to all APCO members, your membership does renew effective January 1st. So if you have not yet renewed your membership, um, the renewal season does continue through APCO International. You're still in the grace period. So if you have not yet renewed your membership, we would encourage you to, to do that today. And then as we move on in our report, our next will come from the North Carolina 911 board. Um, I'll first ask Melanie Neal, our NC APCO representative to the 911 board to share an update. And then we'll call on 911 executive director Pokey Harris to also share some remarks. So Melanie. Thank you, Grayson. Good morning, everybody. So um, I want to share that the January 911 board meeting that was scheduled for Friday, January the 22nd has been canceled. And uh, they, we didn't have enough on the agenda to move forward with having that meeting. So um, we will still have the funding committee meeting scheduled for January 21st at 1 p.m. if anyone cares to join that committee meeting. Also, the fiscal year 22 estimates, estimated distributions have been sent um, by the deadline that was December the 31st. They have already been distributed to all of the primary PSAPs in the state. So please make note of those if you haven't. And if you have any funding reconsiderations that need to be sent in, those will be due in February. I am not sure the exact date, so I'll defer to Pokey to give that date in February that those funding reconsiderations are due. Um, I will also encourage everybody to please join any committee meetings that you feel like you are interested in, education committee, funding committee, grant committee, all of those committee meetings are posted on the 911 board's website for NCDIT. So please go to the site and see if you want to join those meetings. They're open meetings. So please, I encourage all PSAT managers and anyone involved in 911 to join those meetings. And Grayson, that's all I have for now. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Um, and I now recognize Pokey Harris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the sake of bandwidth, I'll just do audio. Uh, Melanie certainly went through and uh, captured uh, a lot of what I had on my list. So thank you, Melanie. I will go ahead and note that the board did close out the year um, uh, setting their goals for upcoming 2021. We reviewed 2020 goals, very much so on target. And looking at 2021, we uh, each committee will be moving um, in that direction. And, and as Melanie noted, uh, committee um, uh, interest is very important. As we closed out the closed out 2020, uh, we had 64 PSAPs on the ESINET. 
Uh, that was a total of 99 physical locations because of the backup facilities that are involved. Um, we uh, also want to work, continue working with all the PSAPs to make sure that their data uh, is uh, at that 98% uh, goal for their I3 standard. Uh, as you know, GEOCOM and CGIA is working with all 100 jurisdictions to accomplish that. Um, I would like to make a comment on what Elton uh, noted about uh, uh, being on site, uh, your vendors being on site for your EasyNet migration, that is extremely important. And I thank him for doing that. So not only your recorder, but your radio vendor, uh, CAD vendor, any other vendor that, that you have product, it is very important that they're engaged in your migration um, uh, project plan as well as being on site. I will go ahead uh, and apologize for not having already sent out an in introduction to Sarah Templeton who is our newest uh, financial review specialist. And she rounds out our concept for the PSAP assistance team. And you all have heard us talk about the PAT. The PAT partner is your regional coordinator and a financial review specialist so that they serve as your liaison or conduit, if you will, to the board. Uh, they're there to help you with any needs that you have. Uh, we're beginning to streamline the processes for eligibility, for, for report review, for reconsiderations. Um, and even, even grant submissions. Um, I'll go ahead and, and just uh, park here for just a minute and share some ideas, share the concept with you a little more. Uh, you do know that we have the four regional co coordinators um, divided and we will send out a, a new map for that. And you can find the map on, um, uh, on our website that also denotes the financial review specialist. The regional coordinator primarily serves as the manager, if you will, and I'm doing air quotes here, manager from the 911 board perspective or office perspective for each of their, their regions. Now, that does not mean that my door's not open, Marsha's door's not open, Gary's door's not open, we're all here for you. But that regional co uh, coordinator does serve as your primary point of contact. And then as we bring the the financial review specialist to that as your PAT, you have a very powerful team to assist you in any needs that you might have. So please do not hesitate to work with them or talk with them uh, for anything that you may need. I'll go ahead and note that we had a very successful continuity of operations plan workshop um, in December. It was a three day series, virtual series, and each day we had 100 participants with that. So I hope that that was very beneficial for all the PSAPs and that you're beginning to work on your continuity of operations plan. I can go ahead and tell you with, with COVID, the increase in uh, cases that we're seeing that are impacting PSAPs. Uh, we've had some, um, some PSAPs that have had to <clears throat> um, activate COOP uh, or their COOP planning uh, because of that. So this is a very critical time for any PSAP that hasn't looked at their um, continuity of operations to go ahead and do so. Coming up, uh, you, if by the end of this month, you sh we will be sending out notification for the grant workshop for the 2022, hard to believe, PSAP grant cycle. So be watching for that. The workshop will be in March. Uh, so uh, again, it will be virtual as it was last year. And the only other thing I do want to report is uh, we will be um, uh, planning to um, put together the study group um, for our upcoming uh, enhancements, uh, revisions to the state 911 plan. Uh, APCO and Nina will be asked to provide um, uh, an individual for that. Um, we look at non-board member representatives. So um, I will be talking with both um, Melanie and Donna about that so that APCO and Nina can provide us a representative. Grayson, that's all I have, and Happy New Year to everyone. All right, very good. Thank you, Pokey. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Um, as we move on in our reports, the next will be from the Nominations Committee and Ray Gilliland. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as most of you know, the nominations ended back in December, and thus far, uh, the nominations we have for the APCO candidates will be for second vice president, we have Herman Weiss from Jawan County, Candy Miller from Iredale County, Samantha Dutch from Scotland County. Moving forward, uh, regional ambassadors, um, this year's elections will be for region B, D and F, uh, Marissa Walters for region B, uh, still have an open for region D, 
no nominations in other words, and Greg Dotson for Region F. For chapter secretary, we have Missy Ezell um, and Katrina Oxendine. Also for chapter secretary, we have Lori Laughlin. Um, the elections should start at the end of January and run through April 1st. And during this time before elections start, we'll be looking at over all the candidates, being sure that they fulfilled all the requirements uh, by the bylaws to become a candidate. And that's all I have, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Ray. And one um, change, Lori Laughlin is actually running for treasurer. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably said secretary. Yes, that's fine. And like you said, the ballots will go out by email by February 1st. And then the candidates will be invited to our next chapter meeting in March to have an opportunity to just present and speak a little bit about themselves. All right, so as we move on in our agenda, next on is the training report from Gerald Anderson. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. We do have uh, two classes currently scheduled. Um, but as a note, any APCO classes effective January 1st of this year offered by the chapter will now be reflected with a new rate to cover the increase that APCO International has put on for class books. The APCO Police Department will be hosting an APCO CTO class from January 23rd to the 24th. That class is up and open for registration through SurveyMonkey. The link has been sent out and will be sent out again today over the list serve. The cost for the class for APCO members is 250 and for non-members 275. APCO Police Department will also be hosting the APCO Communications Center Supervisor class March the 19th through the 21st. Same pricing for APCO members and non-members. Uh, again, registration is open through SurveyMonkey and will be sent out again. Um, for this particular location and all locations that we will do live training at uh, until we get a hold of this virus, all students will be required to wear a mask. All students must submit to screening and temperature check at the beginning of the day. And all students will be arranged in the training setting to promote social distancing for safety reasons. So that means the sizes of our classes will be smaller to accommodate wherever the space that we're giving at the host site. If you had staff registered for either of these two type of classes prior to the pandemic striking, um, you will be given preference to get your staff back in. We realize that you'd already paid to send them to training. If you cannot get them in the classes that are scheduled, um, your money is still good. There'll be no increase on your registration fee for whenever you can get your staff to attend training. We realize that some agencies are still not allowing people to go out and travel or have no travel monies. The call for papers for our North Carolina APCO NINA virtual state conference are open and they will close at 11.45 p.m. on Sunday, February the 7th. We are looking forward to providing a great training at this event. So we are dedicated to providing our members and friends with a host with the best in training and networking opportunities that we can do in a virtual uh, so on a virtual stage in 2021. So this conference plans to continue to meet the standard that we've always had. To make this the best training experience for all attendees, we really need you. If you're a presenter, you know someone that's a pre presenter, I believe they put in the chat earlier, the SurveyMonkey link for those call for papers. Uh, we want to get the hottest topics in our industry out there before our members and friends and make this a great event as we all hope later the next time we'll be able to be in person. Um, we hope that you'll plan on joining us to attend the event if you don't become a speaker and, and have an opportunity for great training, socializing in a virtual format, learning some new skills and knowledge. And then remember, it'll be recorded. So if you can't watch it when it's actually live, you can always go back and enjoy the sessions at your leisure. North Carolina APCO is pleased to announce the 2021 Telecommunicator Training Symposium scheduled for October the 4th through the 6th of this year. Our host site will be the Embassy Suites in Greensboro. Our slogan is still going to be soar to new heights, engage, energize, and empower. More on what the call for presenters will be put out later this year in March. 
We are still um, hopeful that this will be a, a live event, but most likely if it goes forward, it may be virtual. If you wish to host a class this year at your agency and you have a certain topic in mind, or you'd like to host a CTO or supervisor class from APCO International's Institute classes, please contact me directly via email. Mostly everyone has my cell phone, so please call if you need to. At the chapter, the North Carolina chapter of APCO is committed to offering training to our members and friends. And we, we work closely with the executive order that's issued by our governor to make sure that we follow the protocols now that we are back to doing live training. A friendly reminder for all of um, our instructors and people that must have the North Carolina Sheriff Standards Training in service for 2021, that today is January the 13th. You have 11 months and 18 days to finish your 2021 telecommunicated in-service training. 11 months and 18 days. Please do not wait to December 30th to get your training, all right? It is a requirement in the state of North Carolina, if you work under the direction of a sheriff, that you must not only be telecommunicator certified through sheriff standards, but do the in-service. It is required that if you hire any staff between January 1 and June 30th of this year, they must take the 2021 in-service training. Anyone you hire July 1st and later is exempt from the year 2021, but they must start in 2022. If you do not have the classes in-house, please get online with Richmond Community College LMS Community College and the North Carolina Justice Academy and get this training done. Trust me as a person who does the, the Sheriff's Standards Audit for my agency, it is a bear trying to, to, to get all this together at the last minute. If you are an instructor and you currently teach within the in-service classes, you must successfully test out of each block before you're allowed to teach that block of instruction. Don't forget also, it is mandatory that all instructors go to the North Carolina Justice website training online portal where you should have an account and do the mandatory training that was available beginning January 1st of this year for all general instructors that teach these curriculums. It is mandatory. It is also the way that you keep your certification as a general instructor. If you fail to take the training, you have 365 days. If you fail to take the training, you will lose your certification. Remember, it's mandatory. And all of us that have been to general instructor school, we don't want to go back. So please take the training. All right. It is our chapter's goal to always continue to provide quality training for our members across the state at a cost effective cost. We thank you for your support in our efforts by attending the training, promoting the training, and we only want to widen our efforts as we serve the members of our chapter and APCO. So please um, continue to support us, give us your ideas. Uh, we want to be able to stay before you and the membership and give you quality training and keep our staff the best in the country. Mr. President, that's all I have for my report today. Okay, thank you, Gerald. Um, as we move on in our agenda, the next is the treasurer's report, and I'll recognize Lori Laughlin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in our main checking account, we have $269.10. In our symposium account, we have $1,011.47. In our scholarship account, we have $1,432. And the money market account has $56,286.45. For a total of $58,999.02. And that's all I have, Grace. Okay, thank you, Lori. And for those earlier who may not have picked up on it, um, I, I do share this with her permission, but for those that didn't already know, um, Lori did have total hip replacement surgery in mid December. So we are certainly what, uh, glad to have her back with us today, joining us for our meeting. We continue to wish you all the best in your continued healing and recovery, Lori. Thank you. All right, we'll now move into our regional ambassador reports. We'll start with Region A, and I will call on Herman Weiss. Good morning, Grayson. I hope you can hear me. Um, 
Perquimus County reports that they have one full-time opening um, and one part-time opening. You can go to perquimuscountync.gov and look under the employment. Um, they advised everything was going good with EziNet. Had some minor hiccups, but everything was going good. Um, Bertie County reports that they are going to be going EMD very soon. Um, they did not have a go live date. They do have one opening for full time. They're always looking for part time. Um, you can go to the Bertie County website, fill out an application. They advised everything was going good with their EziNet. Um, Chowan County is fully staffed. We are still looking for part time employees. You can go to Chowan County hyphen nc.gov look under employment operation or opportunities um, coa will be holding a emd class college of the Albemarle, um february 2nd through february 4th the course number is 189373 um, everything's going good with our izzy net that's all i have mr president okay thank you herman uh, moving on, our next report come from Region B, and then Judy Caparelli. Thanks, Grayson. Um, the town of Cary is in the beginning stages of their 911 center renovations to include uh, console replacements. They're also installing a fully functional radio system at their backup center, replacing portable radios they currently have there. And that's my only report. Okay, thank you, Judy. Moving on to Region C, Chad Deese. Chad, are you still with us? Sorry, yes, I forgot is. to unmute. Unmute. I have. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Pierre County is reporting that they have currently have two openings. Robson County 911 is reporting that they have two openings and they're accepting applications at this time. Also, we did have our kickoff meeting for Ezinet yesterday with the projected uh, go live around the third quarter. <clears throat> Federal PD uh, reported that their ESINET go live has been pushed back to April. They're also advertising for a TC1 position. And they also wanted me to report that they've only, they've been blessed that they've only had three confirmed cases of COVID-19. However, none affected the center and that they are still going good. Hope County reported that they also have two openings at which they will begin interviews today. They have migrated over to the state EasyNet. They are number 59 and they with, and they went live on November the 13th. And they have completed a migration to Zurcher ProCAD mapping and mobile systems, as well as the Hope County Sheriff's Office migrating over to Zurcher as well. Pretty much all my other counties that I don't have anything to report, they just wanted me to let everyone know that the reasoning is pretty much because COVID has got them at a standstill on most of their projects. That's all. Okay, thank you, Chad. Our next report comes to us from Janet King for Region D. Okay, thank you. Uh, reporting from Chatham County, Mike Wrights, he's stating they're still recovering from a cyber incident that occurred the end of October. Chatham's email addresses have changed Mike states he'll send out something on the he'll send out something on the list serve with the new addresses once they're called up. In the meantime, if you need anything, just call or text Mike. Chatham encourages everyone to review their cyber plans. Having a backup plan is good, but it won't prepare you fully for a cyber event. Reporting from Guilford Metro, Christine Moore. They currently have 13 vacancies. They promoted Michael Taylor to assistant supervisor in December. They will be promoting Amber Lee to the assistant supervisor January 16th. They were able to hire Janine Retano, I may not have pronounced that right, as their administrative assistant and also their technical services divisions bringing on two new hires later in January. And that's from Guilford Metro. From the city of High Point, Kyle Thagger is reporting that last November, their newest employee, Yadaria Patino, graduated from basic telecommunicator training. 
The construction for their new Westchester facility is developing nicely. They have one vacant position. He states, just keep a check on the City of High Point's website. It should post soon. And also, uh, Beth Smith, we all of us know Beth. She's a good friend of ours. She's retired from High Point, and I did speak with her. And she wanted me to express all their gratefulness for your thoughts and prayers since her son's motorcycle accident, and which left him paralyzed from the waist down. And right now, it's unknown if that's going to be a permanent situation. He is in working hard in physical therapy, and the doctors have advised that it could take up to a year for all that complete healing. So it's just too soon, but he is working hard for that. And Beth says she would certainly appreciate continued thoughts and prayers for her and the family. From Burlington Communications, Stephanie Chapman's reported they have three new hires released from training. Their agency began dispatching for Graham PD and Graham Fire Department on New Year's Eve. They're working well on some issues. However, overall, the transition went well. And visit the Burlington website for information of they have one full-time vacancy. And for Randolph County, just crunching some numbers about 2020, the 911 division, we had 98,260 total calls for service and 221,292 telephone transactions. So I know everybody's been busy and everybody's dealing with the COVID situation. Um, as far as the Region D report, that's all I have. I just wanted to add on the compassionate care. I want to encourage everyone to reach out to me or any of the board members of anyone that I need to send a card to. If you could get a name, their address, maybe a little bit about what's going on. And just y'all are doing great about contacting me and please continue to do that. I know in some small ways, some big ways, reaching out like that is, is helping us, especially through all the trying times we're facing. That's my report, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, our next report comes to us from Samantha Dutch for Region E. Good morning. Uh, so with Cabarrus County, Ray Gillen is reporting that they will be going live with EziNet on January 19th. Um, and then for Scotland County, we are currently in the process of filling one vacancy. Um, the application is still open, so you can um, submit applications through, I think, tomorrow it closes. And the uh, email address, or I'm sorry, the uh, URL that you would need to go to is scotlandcounty.org. And then you would be able to find it from there. Um, and that is for a full-time position. But that is all I have. Okay. Thank you, Samantha. Um, our next report for Region F, um, Greg Dodson was un unable to join us today due to some CAD training. So Christine Moore is going to report on his behalf. Good morning, everyone. Director Story McIntyre reports for Cleveland 911 that after battling through December with half of her staff out with COVID, she's happy to report all have returned healthy. They are currently have four open positions, two of which are new positions to their center, and she hopes to start an assessment center later this month to fill those spots. Monica Howard with Hendersonville PD advises that the Hendersonville Police Department went live on EziNet on December 16th. They're in the process of hiring a full-time TCC and have two that have just completed training. Henderson County reported on their Facebook that they would like to congratulate telecommunicator Emily McIntyre, who exhibited great professionalism as she assisted with the delivery of a baby on a recent 911 call. She was able to coach the family and make sure the baby was breathing until first responders arrived on scene. She did a great job remaining calm and giving clear instructions during an extremely stressful time. Rutherford County, Captain Dobson reports, there are, they are on week six of their new PSAP. The transition has remained smooth after the first day. Staff did an excellent job in working from three buildings for a week. Rutherford County are, continues to work with Central Square to implement Enterprise CAD, RMS, and JMS, as well as a host of other programs that will assist all county public safety agencies. The go live date is slated for April, 2021. 
they have four in training to cover evening call taker shifts. Other news in uh, Region F, Clay County announced a new director, so congratulations to Kevin Sellers as he settles into his new role. And that concludes Region F. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Christine. All right, so as we near the end of our meeting, I just wanna take a few moments to reflect on the past year and also make a few special recognitions for individuals who have done a great job serving our chapter. Um, as you know, our last in-person chapter meeting, and this is hard to believe, was in January of 2020. Um, so it's been a year since we have actually met in person. Um, it was at that meeting where both our immediate past president, Brett Wren, announced that he was taking a position in the private sector and then also first vice president Stephanie Connor announced she would be taking a position with the North Carolina 911 board. Uh, both of these required them both to step down from their roles and their positions with North Carolina APCO on our board. <clears throat> we worked through this and I want to first express my gratitude to Christine Moore, who was serving as second vice president at the time and who very quickly stepped into the role of acting first vice president and has been by my side through the ups and downs of everything that was 2020. Um, Christine, there are not enough words to express my gratitude and how much I appreciate your support and friendship through the past year. And just wanna take a moment to, to thank you for everything you've done. The next individual I wanna recognize and thank is Ray Gilliland. Uh, many of you know, Ray served as chapter president from 2012 to 2013. And then when faced with the need to fill the position of immediate past president, Ray was the first person who came to mind. And when I asked Ray, he was immediately willing to step up and step back into this role and serve. And I do appreciate and thank Ray for his willingness to, to also help us over the past year. Also wanna recognize Tracy Trogdon, who was one who volunteered to step into the role of second, acting second vice president. Um, Tracy had previously served on our board as a regional ambassador, so selecting her for this role was an obvious decision. Um, she wasted no time, jumped right in, and started serving in the role right away and has been a tremendous asset to our, to our team over the past year. And while I've specifically mentioned these three individuals, I also want to express my gratitude to the entire North Carolina APCO board. Um, you have all been amazing in adjusting to the changes and have truly stepped up over the past year with your dedication and support to the chapter and public safety communications. So as we navigated 2020, we had to make the last minute decision to cancel our March of 2020 chapter meeting as the coronavirus crisis began taking hold throughout the state. After missing this one chapter meeting, uh, we were able to quickly pivot to a virtual format and eventually with the help and support of our partners with North Carolina Nina, we've been able to conduct our May July, September, and November chapter meetings, and now January of 2021, all virtually. Um, this has been important to ensuring that the work of our chapter has been able to continue, while also providing us with this unique opportunity to reach out to a larger membership base, and also solicit more involvement from our chapter meetings for those who may not have been able to travel in the past to our meetings. <clears throat> so 2020 led us to canceling the majority of our NCAPCO training opportunities, including our telecommunicator training symposium. But, uh, but as you heard in Gerald's report earlier, um, we're happy to slowly begin ramping back up our training opportunities for our membership, um, including beginning to host in-person courses with the strict social distancing and safety precautions in place, like she mentioned. Um, in 2021, we're also excited to present and provide the virtual public safety communications conference in May and continue the planning and coordination for our telecommunicator training symposium, which we hope to be able to hold in person in Greensboro in October of 2021. So for the last, last year, 2020 was filled with challenging times and learning about our new normal, whatever that may be. Um, this has provided us with all, all unique opportunities to really think outside of the box and learn many new ways of doing things. None of these changes have been easy or comfortable for any of us, but on behalf of our chapter, we also want to express our gratitude and thanks to the membership for your continued understanding and patience as we've navigated these ever-changing dynamics, often changing multiple times within a day. <clears throat> so 
So now as we enter into 2021, I'm happy to share with the membership that the state of North Carolina APCO remains very strong and resilient. Uh, we look forward to continuing to serve, support, and advocate for our public safety, telecommunicators, practitioners, and industry partners in the new year. So with those remarks, I will now turn it over and open up to the board members for any other comments before we adjourn our meeting. I would say, Grayson, just know that your board echoes your sentiments towards you and the efforts that you've put forward, uh, as, as well as our chapter staying on board and then remaining engaged. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Christine. Any other board member comments? Okay, any questions or comments from the membership? And has there been anything on the chat? There has not. All right, so our next chapter meeting, um, we will be going back to our Friday chapter meeting schedule. The next chapter meeting is scheduled for um, Friday, March 19th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Um, the full schedule has been posted on our chapter website, so feel free to check that out. Uh, the meeting dates were also scrolling at the beginning of our meeting if anyone saw that and was able to, to write them down, but they are also on our website. And with that, is there a motion to adjourn our chapter meeting? Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. So with that, our chapter meeting is adjourned. Um, we will take a brief recess and then the North Carolina Nina chapter meeting will begin. Thank you all. <laughs>